All right, folks. Uh, Ed, Ed insisted that I started at 4.15, so I, I can't let him down. Um, in the home stretch, uh, again, uh, I can't tell you how much these symposiums mean to me because it's just great to see all these really bright people come up here and, and present ideas or advice or whatever it is. Um, it's just awesome. I mean, you're just in the room with a ton of really, really smart people. You know, there's an old business saying that says, if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. And I have no idea how you all ended up in the wrong room, but I'm glad you're here. Uh, all right. I, I started to do something, I think, I don't know when this started, but I started to talk about the top 10 things I've learned since the last time Verisage got together. And I, I did this in Boston, so I thought I'd do it uh, today. These are the top 10 lessons I've learned since Boston, which was November 2015, so practically exactly two years ago. And I'm really interested in what people do and what people believe. I want to know what they've tried. I want to know what's different. I want to know what's, what, what excites them. It, you know, what, what are they working on? What are they passionate about? Adrian always asks me this. Every time I get together with Adrian, he'll say, tell me what you're passionate about now. And I'm passionate about a lot of things uh, at the moment, and I want to share some of them with you. And these are in no particular order, so I'm not trying to do a David Letterman countdown here or something. I just, I randomly, and I pulled these decks from all over, so the PowerPoints are a mess. I apologize. I don't care. I'm more interested in getting the content. I will make this deck available to you. So please don't feel the need to, you know, try and scratch down everything. There's a ton of content in here. Buckle up. This is advanced, some of it. But you guys are smart. You can handle it, even though I know it's the end of the day and we all want to go drink and play top golf. All right. Number 10, after action reviews alone, I should have capitalized that, can replace timesheets and annual performance reviews. Oh, and by the way, they can save lives too, big time. Let me prove it. This is Le retired Lieutenant Colonel Chris Elroy is his call sign, Strickland, ejecting from an F-16. He's one of the Thunderbirds, which is one of our U.S. Air Force elite flight teams, ejecting from his plane due to pilot air, he admitted it, um, 40 feet above the ground, <laughs> half a second from impact, the total flight was 25 and a half seconds from takeoff to crash, but he said it felt like three hours. And he, when he popped the injection seat, he was only 40 foot feet off the ground, he deployed his parachute, and it, of course, didn't have time to open. He landed in a fireball, compressed his spine two and a half inches, and he walked away. Ed and I interviewed him last Friday on our show, and he said this when we asked him about this infamous picture and this infamous, infamous incident, because I think it's one of the only times that a Thunderbird has crashed at an air show. They've crashed on you know, trials and, and test flights and things like that. And he said, I'm alive today because of after action reviews. Now, I'll tell you, having a Thunderbird on, uh, on our radio show, I felt like a 13-year-old girl at a Beatles concert. I was giddy, and I, oh, I was a total man crush. I've been a fan of the Thunderbird since I could drive a car. There's three or four Air Force bases in Northern California, where I'm from. We had a friend in the United States Air Force. Every time the Thunderbirds did an air show, we knew about it months in advance, and that was it. We were going to be there. So I've seen these Thunderbirds ever since I was 16 or 17 years old, and I've just always loved them, far more even than the Blue Angels, which is the Navy's flight team. And so having this guy on, for me, was more exciting than when we had a guy named Colonel Rick Searfoss on, who was a space uh, shuttle commander. This was more exciting to me. 
But this guy had a very important message. He said, how does the military take a young college grad and turn them into a fighter pilot using the debrief? Now that's the Air Force's term for the after action review. The Navy's call it a hot wash, okay? In other parts of the country, I've talked to some Australian military people, I've talked to Israel military people, Canadian military people, they all have their own name for it. Whether you call it a post-mortem, AAR, whatever. Strickland calls it a debrief, and he says, <clears throat> using the debrief and the resulting lessons learned, which is an experiential learning accelerator, Ed and I call it the most effective learning tool ever devised, period. It really is a powerful, powerful method to actually improve future performance of your organization. Timesheets don't improve future performance. Performance, annual performance appraisals don't, do not improve future performance. They don't. After action reviews do. So <laughs> you think about the Thunderbirds. They do stuff like this with 50% turnover every year. There's only six of them in any one time. Every two years, three of them turn over. And within four months, they're doing stuff like this. How? Now, of course, they are recruiting some of the best pilots and... You know, these people, these aren't their first flights. But to be able to fly 18 inches apart, pass each other at 1,400 miles an hour with 50 feet between you, Strickland said, when you do this maneuver here at the bottom, you can hear the static on the radio go by because of the other plane. And you're 50 feet apart at 1,400 miles an hour. And they make that maneuver solely based on the inflection of their voices. Because as they're coming at one another, they're talking, and they know exactly when to make the maneuver, just based on the inflection in the voice. But you want to talk about trust? You want to talk about teamwork? There is no better example than this. And they do this every two years with 50% turnover. Some companies have had the same team for decades, <laughs> and they can't do crap together. <laughs> so AAR effectiveness, here's what Chris taught us. Only 33% of organizational objectives are achieved, which is an enormous waste of talent, resources, everything else, right? If you do learning from the school of hard knocks, sure, experience will teach us lessons. There's no doubt about it. He says you'll get a 5% future improvement. And that's just the normal human learning curve, right? You're gonna be, more, gonna be more effective doing your 100th flight than your first, or your 100th brief, or your 100th tax return. But he says if you use, even if you use an unstructured AAR, like Ray was talking about, you could just sit around a table and then not have any technology and just talk about what happened and reflect based on your experiences. You'll get a 28% improvement. If you use a structured AAR, you'll get a 38% improvement, but here's the kicker. If you use a structured AAR with a competent facilitator, the military's seen up to 300% performance effectiveness. Now in the military, 5% is good because that translates into lives. 300% is awesome. Now, Strickland says, throw out the 300%. Even if you don't believe that, would you like to get a 38% improvement in your team's performance? Consistently. That's what's so great about it. So he's with a company called Afterburner, and that's how Ed met him. He met him at a SAGE conference that he came, came and spoke, and they're trying to implement debriefs into basically corporate America. I don't know if he works internationally or not. But, and I asked him, I said, are you finding this a challenge to get companies to adopt this? He goes, absolutely. You know, because they don't see the value in this. And, which is really a shame, because they'll spend enormous resources doing the kabuki theater of annual performance appraisals, which has zero effect on future performance. In fact, I think it has a detrimental effect on future performance, and yet look at the resources most companies spend on those. You know, the HR department's got their little checklists and their little features, they've got their little KGB dossier on everybody, and it doesn't improve future performance. The AAR does. I even sat through an after-action review in an ICU ward with a doctor 
for some reason, we started talking about the AAR. He said, really, you know about AARs? I said, oh, yeah. I said, I think they're really effective tools. He said, we do them every day at the end of every shift in the ICU. Now, this is life and death situations. He let me sit in on one. I'm listening to doctors and RNs and other medical competent people sit around in a circle in the middle of the ICU with a lot of really critically sick people around them talking about the day shifts and what happened, what went right, what went wrong. And here's an RN admitting that when she turned the man over to do something, his tube came out and code blue went off. And she's admitting a mistake in a life and death situation. And she's doing it with no fear because this isn't a blame game. It's not a point the finger game. It's a learning tool. I told this to a group of lawyers, and they said, well, that, that exposes them to legal liability. I said, I understand that. I said, but I asked this lawyer, I said, let me ask you a question. Would you want your son or daughter in a hospital that did AARs or one that didn't? Doctors are going to make mistakes. We're humans. The point is we got to learn from those mistakes, and we're not going to learn as effectively if we don't take the time to step back and reflect on our action. I mean, it, I'll admit that reflection without action is passivity, and action without reflection is thoughtlessness, though. But you combine action and reflection, and you've got learning that lasts. And that's why Strickland calls it the debrief and lessons learned. And he credits it with saving his life, which is kind of amazing when you think about it. We're only talking about being more effective. And then he said, it's not just a debriefing, it's a culture of debriefing. And I count the After Action Review as one of the, the latest and greatest management innovations. You know, most of the tools that we use to, to manage companies come from the 1890s up to the, the, the latest ideas like 1950, capital budgeting, cost accounting, all these different things. Here's an after action. I mean, management has stopped innovating. This is well documented in a great book by a guy named Gary Hamill, who's a Harvard business professor, and he wrote a great book called The Future of Management. In fact, it was the first book I assigned to the Verisage Fellows when we had our first meeting in Vegas. And he said, you know, Management has become the combustion engine. It's just there hasn't been a new innovation. Yeah, we tweak it, we make it better, but it's incremental improvements. This is a true management innovation, and if you think about what it could possibly replace and how much more effective it is, it's, it's well worth it. And here is Strickland's method for doing an after-action review. Now, this is the United States Air Force, but I thought this was really cool when he explained this. They love their acronyms in the military, and it's known as stealth. You set the time of the AAR. So I'll give you an example of after the Thunderbirds do an air show, you know, for a million people. They will spend three and a half hours doing roughly, he says, an after-action review. When we talk to the astronaut uh, after a space shuttle flight, the after-action review, See, 11 days, 11 days after they land. They take a day off, I think, and then they go in and they spend 11 days going through everything about the mission, what went right, what went wrong. 11 days. Ele uh, yes, I know, it's all non-billable. <laughs> but it's, it's adding immensely as, uh, to your invisible balance sheet, as Paul Kennedy calls it, your invisible balance sheet, that intellectual capital that actually grows the value of your business because it enhances your ability to create wealth for your customers. You set the tone. So you, it's actually nameless and rankless. Now, obviously, everybody knows everybody's name, but they take their hats off and they lay it down, rank, rank down on the table. There's no rank in these things. So... And, and they let the lowest ranked person, I know it's kind of ironic, but they let the lowest you know, level talk first because you don't want the colonel to say something and then you know, everybody below him says, oh yeah, what the colonel thinks. You, know, you, you, you want to give the, the lowliest person on the mission the chance to speak first. And then you analyze the execution versus the objectives. And it's really simple. Did we meet our objectives? He says it's kind of binary, <laughs> yes or no. And then you analyze, you ask why, why, why? You know, the Toyota production system, why, why, why? Because that gets to the real root cause of, of the issue. And you talk about lessons learned and you capture them and the, the root causes of what went right and wrong. And you put those lessons somewhere 
where they can be accessed, like Bray's software tool or a knowledge bank or uh, create a internal, you know, blog or, or, you know, a wiki page or something and tag it and put a taxonomy around it. Uh, and then people can, can draw down knowledge when they need it, which could be used to bring a new team member up to speed or whatever it might be. And then transfer those lessons learned to the organization. And, and that, that you can do that with technology like I just described. So that's the, that's the stealth thing. Uh, and then always end on a high note. Always end on a high note. Celebrate a success. You know, yes, you're gonna focus on what, what went wrong, but talk about what went right so you can replicate it. You know, I, I know we can learn from failure, but I kind of agree with Peter Drucker on this. I think we can learn more from success than failure, believe it or not. Peter Drucker had a very contrarian view on that, on that topic, and it took a long time for me to process it and for, for, for me to be convinced by his logic, but I think he's right. But either way, make sure you celebrate success. When you start value pricing, make sure you celebrate your successes. Yes, I want you to analyze your errors and, and, and get better, but when you have a success with pricing, celebrate it. It's something to be celebrated. A uh, couple great books on this. Uh, the one I read that taught me about AARs back in, I don't know what it was, 1999 or something, was Hope is Not a Method, which is by Gordon Sullivan, who is a US general who implemented AARs in the Army in the post-Watergate era, so around 1975. It took the United States Army about 15 years to make AARs a cultural regularity, <laughs> something that they did just as part of their DNA. The institution rejected it when he first proposed it. He said, well, the military is very hierarchical, and you know, you can't have subordinates, you know, subordinating command. You just can't do that. This is, this is not going to work. Everybody poo-pooed this idea, but this guy stuck with it. He saw, he saw it as a way to boost morale after our failure in Vietnam, but then they realized after they had done it for a while that it was an amazing knowledge tool because the Army has this great saying, we never want to build the same bridge twice, so they capture AARs. And now today, Ed and I both have talked to people that have served, you know, tours in Iraq or Afghanistan or whatever, say, we go to the bathroom, we change the toilet paper, we do an after action review. I mean, it's just part of the culture. And the other one is the book that Strickland mentioned on the show, which is Flawless Execution by James D. Murphy. That's his mentor. That's who kind of taught him about the debrief and the lessons learned, uh, maybe even had something to do with him being a pilot. Uh, but those are two books, two excellent books on the whole after action review process. And uh, just like Ray said, you can start to do these with your customer as well. I, I would suggest that you wait until you get comfortable with them internally. But once that process happens, and we think that takes about 12 to 18 months, uh, Paul Kennedy can probably share some experiences with you on that as well. Uh, but then you can start to go out and do these with your customer as well. And you'll find that these are much better than the satisfaction survey that nobody fills out, right? I mean, when was the last time you filled out a satisfaction survey? Do you drop your bags in the hotel and see the little card there that says, tell us about your stay and go, ooh, goody, goody, and sit down and do it? No. The, the only people that fill those things out are people that had a really crappy experience or, you know, had a really great experience, but you're not going to hear about that, that mass in the middle. And so the after action review is a great thing also to use with your with your customers. Number nine is <laughs> the end of accounting is real. I know it sounds kind of like uh, hyperbole, but I don't think it is. We actually interviewed Baruch Lev on the show who wrote the book with Fangu, The End of Accounting. These are two PhD accountant teachers, New York School, Ed. Um, and I will tell you that this book is amazing. Now, I know the lawyers, your eyes are glazing over, and anybody who's not an accountant, your eyes are glazing over, go, oh my God, I hope he doesn't talk about this. I'm not, I'm only gonna give you the highlights, but I'll tell you, if you're an investor, and you have a retirement fund, and you invest it in public companies, you're gonna wanna kinda know about this, because this is kind of amazing. What these guys point out is that accounting is just irrelevant to investment decisions anymore, completely irrelevant to the one person or the one group it's supposed to help the most, which is the outside investor. It does no such thing. And they have documented this in the most creative and, and scholarly way that I've ever seen. Um, 
you know, they say accounting isn't about facts anymore. It's about managers' subjective opinions, estimates, and projections. And Warren Buffett even called, you know, we, you know, accountants mark things to market, but it, it should be called rather, you know, mark to myth. Because it's really true. Accountants can't tell you the future value of something. Accountants can't even tell you the present value of something because accounting is not a theory. <laughs> accounting is an identity equation. Assets minus liabilities equals capital. That's not a theory. It's not a theory of value. This is why accountants use the term goodwill, right? So when a company like Facebook buys a company like WhatsApp, WhatsApp was sold or, or bought by Facebook for $18.2 billion, with a B, dollars. It was like 50 programmers in Georgia, and I'm not talking about the state. If the book value of WhatsApp was a million dollars, I would I would be amazed, and that would be some food, you know, some foosball tables, and you know, refrigerators stuck stocked with uh, Red Bull, and some computers and some furniture. But when accountants booked that transaction, 18.2 billion minus one million, where do they plug the difference? Goodwill. Paul O'Byrne used to say, "Goodwill is the word accountants use to describe their ignorance." And now that 80% of the world's wealth, 80% of the world's wealth resides in intellectual capital and, and, and I'm sorry, in human capital, the stuff between our ears, accountants can't measure it, financial statements can't measure it. Now, this is not an indictment of GAAP. GAAP was never designed to do this. GAAP was just a design to record a transaction at a price that was agreed upon by the parties. It can't look into the future. It has no mechanism to do so and we're asking it to do something that it's not capable of doing. It's like this gentleman says, you know, accounting statements are like bikinis. What they show is interesting, but what they conceal is significant, <laughs> right? <clears throat> and when it comes to human capital and intellectual capital, accountants completely ignore it they, because they, there's nothing else they can do with it. It's economists that have taught us the value of human capital. Accountants just expense it as wages but it's a real live, valuable thing. It's 80% of the world's wealth, and accountants have no say in it. Um, number eight, cost accounting is dead. Cost accounting is dead. H. Thomas Johnson and a guy named Dr. Reginald Lee Thomas has killed it. And this is where this is gonna get a little bit rocky, so you're gonna have to stick with me. This is some heavy duty content, and I've tried to simplify it as best I can. This is the thing I am most excited about. Well, other than talking to the Thunderbird. Again, I'm just like a little giddy girl about that. Um, in fact, I think Ed had to remove his headphones because I was screeching during the show. Um, it was really quite amazing. Um, we did our after action review after the show like we always do. And the first, I just, I just, Ed called me on Skype and I just came on. I said, best damn show we've ever done. And we've done, we've had some guests that are my all-time heroes in life, like Dr. Thomas Sowell and George Gilder and all these fantastic economists that I greatly look up to, but man, nothing is as exciting as the Thunderbirds. But anyway, all right, here we go. The four defenses of timesheets. Here are the four defenses every firm will throw at you when you say, well, I don't do timesheets, and they'll start asking you questions, or if you're trying to convince an audience to get rid of timesheets, convince an audience of any type of professional, they'll say, nope, we need them to price. Well, I think we've destroyed that. I think that's pretty well settled, that you don't need timesheets to price. The second one is we need them to measure the efficiency of our people. If you think timesheets measure the efficiency of your people, I call that the illusion of control. <laughs> they do not, because somebody can look great on a timesheet and be a crappy professional. Is that true? Somebody can get all their budgets in on time, maybe even ahead of time, but they could have the poorest uh, professionalism, the poorest pride, the, the, the worst customer service. They could piss off everybody they come in contact with. It's not predictive of an effective knowledge worker to look good on a timesheet, have a high realization, have a high utilization. Those numbers are all contrived anyway. The other thing people say is we need them for project management. And well, Ed Klass has completely destroyed this argument. And we like to say that using a timesheet for project management is like timing your cookies without, with a smoke alarm. By the time you see it on a timesheet, it is by definition, by definition, no longer manageable. You're looking at spilt milk and, and you're crying over it with a timesheet. 
It's useless. What you need to look at are, lay, are leading indicators, and we have KPIs, and Ed, Ed teaches proper project management, which is definitely a superior replacement for the timesheet, but it's this argument here. It's the cost accounting argument that's bothered me for a decade. Because people will say, well, how do I measure the profitability of a job or a customer without timesheets, without allocating my costs, without doing cost accounting? In other words, how do you do cost accounting without timesheets? Well, I always responded, do you think we need timesheets to do cost accounting? Is that the only way to do cost accounting? Well, that's what the big four say. There was just an article written by a lawyer that says the big four still keeps them. They value price, but they still keep timesheets. And we lawyers, we need to, we need to listen to the big four. And, and I tweeted this, this person, and I said, what if the big four are wrong? What if the big four are wrong? Here's what I mean. This, is, this really struck me one day sitting in an airport. There's a crucial principle for coming to know the truth. Have any of you in here ever changed your mind about a significant issue? I, I hope every hand goes up. Uh, I, I've changed my mind on lots of things. We don't have to get into it. And I'm not talking about, you know, now you like red wine, not white, or vanilla ice cream, not chocolate. I'm talking about you changed your mind on abortion, or you changed your mind on a political party, or something significant. I mean, a real hardwired belief that just goes through your soul. Yeah, we change our mind. And this woman, who's a philosopher, she said this, our ability to engage in continuous conversation, testing one another, discovering our hidden pres uh, presuppositions, changing our minds because we have listened to the voices of our fellows. Lunatics also change their minds, but their minds change with the tides of the moon and not because they have listened, really listened to their friends' questions and objections. And usually when I talk about this material I'm about to show you, I, you know, it's usually groups of accountants or lawyers, I say, I come before you as a friend who's got a problem with cost accounting. I've learned that this doesn't do what it purports to do. In fact, it distorts the very thing that it purports to be doing. And these three books convinced me. Now this took, this was a long process. This wasn't some burning bush moment or you know, some blinding flash of the obvious that happened on a mountain drive. This was a slow, agonizing process because I used to be a cost accountant. This was in my DNA. It, it was part of my identity as a CPA, as a professional, as, as knowledgeable, as an expert, and all of those things. But H. Thomas Johnson wrote a book called Profit Beyond Measure. I forget the year. But it's a seminal work because it's a study of Toyota. Toyota's never used a standard cost accounting system. Now, the interesting thing about H. Thomas Johnson is he's an accounting professor <laughs> at, I believe, Oregon State University. And somebody came up to him at a conference and said, have you ever studied Toyota? And he said, no. He said, you know, they don't use a standard cost accounting system at Toyota. They never have in their entire corporate existence. He looked at this guy and he said, bullshit. There's no way. Toyota is one of the most innovative, profitable car companies on the planet. There's no way that they don't know their costs and they don't have cost accountants and standard cost accounting system. This guy said, go study them. And he did. Spent five years hanging around Toyota plants, mostly in the States, but also in Japan. This book is a result. Folks, when I read that, I said, how is it possible for a company like Toyota not to have a standard cost accounting system? My worldview was totally shattered. That's impossible. It's completely shattered. And when I tell that, especially to groups of cost accountants, they, they have all these justifications for why it's wrong. I said, rather than thinking or making justifications for why you think that's false, have you ever thought maybe there's a better way? Wow, maybe this is a, a fact that actually challenges my worldview. I should go investigate this. I was telling Paul Kennedy the other day, I live in abject fear that my worldview is incorrect. Abject fear especially if I'm presented with alternative empirical evidence. I'm, I want to search out those anomalies because that's how we progress as a civilization. The other book is Dr. Reginald Thomas Lee, who we also interviewed on the show. And how many of you have read The Goal? The Theory of Constraints? 
This guy hated cost accounting. Ed and I found a video he did, and it's crappy quality. I got to give it to Ryan, let him spruce it up. But he's ranting and raving towards the end of his life about cost accountants and what crap it is and how it's destroying organizations. Interestingly enough, Goldratt, the author of The Goal, was an engineer. So is Dr. Lee. Dr. Lee, by the way, was supposed to be here. I wanted him to present this. I said, I'm a, I'm a uh, you know, substandard substitute for your work, because now he's sent me all sorts of PowerPoint decks and presentations that he's been doing, and I've tried to filter this through my worldview. Um, I, but it's the next best thing I could do for you, because we couldn't get them. Uh, but here's what he says. Cost and profits are not absolute. They change based on the model you use to calculate them. The largest expenditure for most companies, and certainly most professional firms, is capacity, meaning space, rent, labor, materials, equipment, and technology. Unless you model and manage capacity effectively, you will not achieve the cash flow results you seek. Because if you have to pay 100 grand for rent, I don't care how you utilize it, whether you put one person in that office or 100. It doesn't matter. It's 100 grand in cash that you're on the hook for. So you say, well, what's it cost per office? Well, now you have to do a division and create a ratio and a relationship that doesn't exist in reality. But that's what cost accountants do all the time. They, they build relationships that actually don't mean anything. They're actually just arbitrary opinions. He also says this, there is too much focus on accounting data and not enough on understanding the factors that influence the data. The idea, that, and this is really profound, the idea that you can calculate different costs from the same data and information should suggest that costs do not represent cash. Cost accounting confuses, confuses measurement with metrics. Companies spend millions to manage costs that have nothing to do with money. <laughs> That's amazing. That's absolutely amazing. And this little line here, I'm not going to gloss over this, that he says cost accounting confuses measurement with metrics, that's profound. That was one of my BFOs, especially reading this book. This is profound. Let me explain it. If we have temperature gauges and we all walk outside, take the temperature, my guess is, as long as it's a pretty you know, decent thermometer, you're going to get a pretty accurate reading, right? Certainly within a degree or so. That's a measurement. But, and let's just take inventory valuation, right? For, say, a manufacturer. You know there's different, I'm kind of speaking to the accountants now, because the lawyers, again, their eyes are probably glazing over at this point. But you know there's an average cost method, a FIFO method, and a LIFO method. Well, what's the net income? computed using those different methods. Just look at the table. Just look at one year on the table, 2017. Somewhere between 19,900, 24,890, and 17,050. <laughs> Are you kidding me? How can this have anything to do with cash if we can have that type of variance in the net income number? This is insane because that's a metric. Those are metrics and they're computed based on relationships that don't exist and don't have anything really to do with actual cash flow. All of these different types of cost accounting methods result in different amounts. I can use standard costing, I can use total absorption costing, average costing, lean costing, marginal costing, and activity-based costing. Each one of them will throw off a different amount per hour cost, per unit cost if you're making a product. How do I know what to do? He says, revenue minus cost, yes, that's profit, that's true. But money minus non-cash opinions equals money is false, <laughs> right? Uh, he says you can't subtract apples from oranges and you can't subtract opinions from money. Look, just look at this. This is an F-16, has a unit cost of 18.8 .8 million. Now that's a cash cost to the military. But the operational cost per flight hour has been estimated by, at between 7,000 and 22,470 or 24 grand, depending on the calculation method. Does that shed light to anybody on anything? <laughs> I mean, this is, this is insane. And yet, we treat cost accounting data like it's gospel. And I'll tell you who's really bad about this, not accountants. We accountants understand this. I bet you guys are sitting there nodding your head. You know that accountants can cook the books. What do you want? What do you, you know, what's two plus two? Accountant, great answer. What do you want it to be? Right? We know how to do stuff. 
We can make the bottom line sing or, or squeal. The accountants get this. It's the lawyers and the other professionals that think what the accountants tell them is gospel, and it's not. It's not. So, Lee Seagal, I've never heard of this law until I read Lee's book. I don't know who Lee Seagal is, but he said, a man with one watch knows what time it is. A man with two watches is never quite sure. That's a fantastic indictment of cost accounting, because that's exactly where we are with it. So let me give you a thought experiment. Just an Apple Pencil for the iPad, you know, the iPad Pro. Let's just say that the average cost is $25. Now, don't ask me how they got that, because you, they probably had a range of between $10 and $100, right? Obviously, the cost per pencil is going to vary just simply with the quantity produced, <laughs> which has, you know, and, and, and people say, well, because of economies of scale, the more you produce, the less cost per pencil. Yeah, but the more you produce of anything, there's going to be more cash cost because you have to buy more materials. And if you're building cars, more tires and more steel and more engine parts. It doesn't cost less to produce more. But let's just take this as a given. The average cost per pencil is 25 bucks. What does that tell you? What does that tell Apple? Does that mean they pay $25 in cash when they make one? No. Do they save $25 if they don't make one? No. <laughs> Uh, Apple made $4 billion to get the unit cost down to 25 bucks. but here's an interesting question. What if demand is only $1 billion? Yeah, they got their unit costs down, but their cash costs were enormous. Now, if you think that's kind of a ridiculous example, I give you General Motors. General Motors is all about you know, spreading fixed costs and economies of scale and producing as many cars as they can to get the unit costs down so their margins on each car sale are greater. There's no demand for GM cars, <laughs> right? They can't sell them. And because they made so many of them over demand, their cash is, is just, that's why they went into bankruptcy, for crying out loud, right? You've got to take into account demand. These things aren't just siloed. We can't just say we, we got to do everything we can to get the unit cost down. A higher gross margin will be calculated, but total cash costs will be higher. When you produce more units with the same capacity, yeah, you're being more efficient, but you're not necessarily saving cash. If you've got a lawyer working on a brief and they're on a fixed salary of whatever it is, 80 grand, 100 grand, whatever, and they take 10 hours to do that brief rather than the five you thought it should have take, your cash costs haven't changed one penny, not one. Now, people argue, well, but your opportunity cost has because now it's five hours that they can't work. Well, that's true only if you're working at 100% capacity. If you're working at 100% capacity, you're crazy because you're going to kill your people <laughs> because we're not machines. You can't work at 100% capacity. No firm does. You don't want professionals at 100% capacity. You don't want your dentist at 100% capacity, so when you call up with this raging toothache, he says, oh, well, gee, Ed, sorry, I can't see you for a couple weeks. No, you want him to be able to say, come on down, we're going to fit you in. You always want professionals to have capacity so they're there when you need them. Are there any costs not adding value to the customer? It, it doesn't tell Apple any of these things. It, it's, it's just, it's after the fact generation of metrics. Let me give you another quick gedanken to, to illustrate this. Sales price of a book is $15. So this company that Lee consulted with, he told the story on our show, uh, produced a book and they were gonna sell it for 15 bucks. And they said, well, we wanna go out and produce 10,000, that's gonna cost us 10 grand, so we'll get a unit cost of a buck a book, right? You with me? This is pretty simple cost accounting, but buck a book. And that's a $14 gross margin. The, but Lee comes in and says, well, why don't you use the digital print option on demand and produce 5,000 books for eight grand at a buck 60 a book? And they said, well, that's 60 cents higher per unit. That, that'll kill us. <laughs> and Lee says, yeah, but the demand is only for 5,000 books, not 10,000. So if you look at the two options and you look at it from a cash flow perspective, which one would you rather have? Now add six zeros to this and let's call it General Motors and tell me if it makes a difference. Cost accounting can lead you dangerously 
down the wrong path because it separates you from your operations. Lessons, don't let calculated costs influence your operations. And here's the replacement, model cash flow. And this is something accountants also understand. Model cash flow. Let's stop trying to figure out how much of the, each roll of toilet paper needs to be allocated to every job because that's certainly a relationship that doesn't exist, although it might with some clients, I understand that, um, <laughs> especially F clients. Um, but we got to look at cash flow. We got to model cash flow. That's where Lee ends up. So let me tell you why timesheets are terrible cost accountants. First off, I'm always amused when a firm tells me, we have 10 grand in this project at their hourly rate of whatever it is, 200, 300, 400 an hour. Is that true? Did they actually spend 10 grand for that project? No. First off, their hourly rate includes profit. Well, cost accounting doesn't deal with profit, it just deals with cost. Second, there's no re relation to a firm's actual cost to their hourly rate. There's not a firm I know that takes their actual GL expenses and divides it by the number of hours they build and says this is our cost per unit. And even if they tried to do that, it still wouldn't work because it's heavily dependent upon volume <laughs> and a whole bunch of other operational decisions. Attempting, you're, think about what you're doing with a P&L, an income statement, with hourly billing. You're attempting to run that P&L for every six minutes of the company's existence. It's an insane way to deal with a system, an interdependent system, like our human bodies, right? Your human body is an interdependent system. Sometimes it's going to be less efficient in some areas to be more healthy overall, right? And that's how systems work. Some parts of the, this is what the goals uh, uh, theory was, the theory of constraints, that some parts of the system have to be deliberately less efficient for the entire system to be more effective as a whole. This is why Google gives 20% time. That's not efficient, but it does make them more effective by creating innovative products and, and services that people love. Google Mail, Gmail, Books, Earth, whatever. The other thing is it doesn't account for the lifetime value of the customer. This is the point that Paul Kennedy made in his wonderful essay about the, the billable hour only focuses on the math of the moment and doesn't take into account the lifetime value of the customer. And we've been talking a lot about developing trust, and Stephen talked about how long it takes. Well, you know, trust takes a while to, to build up, but it gallops away, <laughs> can gallop away really fast. We can lose trust really fast, and it's very hard to recreate and rebuild. And timesheets and cost accounting can answer the most important question for pricers, which is how much money did we leave on the table? The only way we can figure that out is to understand that or infer that feeling of value. That's why we wanted to give you that Q-Force question. Time is not value, it's not cost. Time is just a constraint, <laughs> as I'm learning real quick as I look at the clock. Um, <laughs> it's a constraint. Uh, different answers depend on different costing models used. We already talked about that. And people argue with me that the hourly rate has got opportunity costs, and we have to consider opportunity costs. But here's the problem. When do you have to consider opportunity cost? upon intake. Once you take on a client and learn that you lost money, that's not opportunity cost anymore. That's what economists call a sunk cost. <laughs> and it's done, over. You should move on. Your life, should, you should just put it behind you because there's not anything you can do about it. Opportun we have to, to think about things upon intake. Should we take this client at what's our minimum price and all of that? And that's why we're such big advocates of minimum price. And of course, timesheets don't improve future performance. Can anybody make an argument that timesheets improve future performance? Baker, you're supposed to spend four hours on that and you spent 10. Is that gonna help me do it better next time? <laughs> no, might an after action review? Possibly, uh, most likely actually. So. That's my rant against why cost accountants are terrible, uh, timesheets are terrible cost accountants. Let me just give you another quick gedank, and again, make this really simple. You're a sole proprietor. You've got 100 grand in overhead. I don't care if it's rent, or maybe a part-time receptionist, technology cost, whatever. And you estimate you're gonna work 3,000 hours and have 1,500 billable. So we're already confronted with a relationship problem. What, which, what do I divide the 100 grand by? Which number? to get cost per hour. Which number? <laughs> Anybody? Accountants? 
What do you think? Well, you should do it by 1500 because it's supposed to be on, you know, actual billable time. So that'd be 67 bucks, right? But if you did 3000 you're at 33 <laughs> We're back to having four watches, you know? Which one's right? But let's say you complete 1,500 hours by November 30th in your firm, your solo firm, and you're done for the year because you followed all of Ed's project management and you just stayed on top of everything, just like a charm, worked beautifully. And on December 1st, a new customer walks in, gives you a 100-hour project. Now, theoretically, your cost per unit is 6250 What does that mean? That means you've been over-allocating every other client prior to November 30th by five bucks an hour. Now, multiply that by 10,000 employees across a worldwide firm with customers coming and going, and tell me if this is meaningful to anybody. It's not. It's not even close. People say, well, at least it's something. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, so are boils. <clears throat> <clears throat> if you divide it by 3,000, by the way, you're stuck with another problem because now how do you allocate the other 1,400 of non-billable time? You're going to do that based on weighted average of revenue? or can, can, can you see the rat hole you start to go down that has no no relationship at all to how you serve customers, how you create a great product, a great experience, any of that. We're just sitting around, you know, bayoneting the wounded after the war with historical cost accounts. By the way, why pricers hate cost accountants. Dr. Lee said this, three reasons costing is a bad practice. To get a cost, you have to create and force math and relationships that do not exist. By doing this, you lose touch with your operations and you create meaningless numbers that people consider as gospel. He calls it a single representation of an artificial reality. I love the way he words stuff. He's just a brilliant guy, wasn't he? He was just a great, he was just a great guest. Listen to our show with him. Uh, he was very, very entertaining. I so wish he could have been here. H. Thomas Johnson, this is the, the cost accounting professor that studied Toyota, wrote Profit Beyond Measure. He said, you can use accounting to describe a business's external condition, but it offers little insight into the particular inner relationships that determine those results. And he says, because cost and profit are not objects, but are properties that that emerge from relationships, where have we heard that word over today? Relation, we're a relationship business. Quantitative measures can only describe them. They cannot explain them. In other words, translate this into terms that um, a lot of us can understand, maybe even after tonight. We can audit the drunk's bar bill, but we can't explain why he's an alcoholic. Nor will cost accounting help you change his behavior. And it doesn't sh shed any insight on it. So there's a lot of tension, by the way, between pricers and cost accountants. It's one of the reasons, because pricers have to know their cost before you do the work, not after. They have to know the cost of building the car before they build it, not after, <laughs> right? Which forces us to look at value first and set price, and then say the price justifies the costs that we can incur to produce a product or service at a price or at a profit we can live with. And so uh, what replaces the billable hour in the timesheet? Well, we've been talking about business model change, value-based pricing. Everybody thinks you get rid of timesheet and it's just chaos. The walls are going to come down and every, everybody's going to be running around with, like chickens without their heads and you know everything's just going to be just radical anarcho-capitalism and nobody's going to have any accountability and no, nothing's going to get done and there's going to be no incentive for this. There's no, going to be no accountability. It's such nonsense. Look at the replacement for timesheets. Does this look like anarchy to anybody? <laughs> this is actually kind of a long list. But these are far superior methods for a knowledge organization, far superior. And if you just took the time that you spent doing timesheets and spent that time on doing after action reviews, you'd be miles ahead of the competition, miles. It'd be so much better, and you'd actually improve future performance. It's an exciting day here at the office. We're installing these new uh, productivity lights. 
These babies are going to revolutionize the agency environment and make timesheets and billable hours more efficient than ever before. We keep track of what everyone in this office is doing every 15 minutes, every single day. This way, as you can see, we can be 100% productive. Very excited about the productivity lights. They are going to make billable time more billable. The plan is to reduce unaccounted time percentages. Take, for example, Michael. Last Tuesday from 9.45 to 10 a.m., he was completely unaccountable. Absolutely no explanation as to what he was doing, and that's totally unacceptable. I was taking a shit. But Frank here, just last week he set a new record billing 135% of his time. By definition, this is impossible, but Frank, that magnificent bastard, he did it. Number seven, we gotta move from tasks to transformations. And our, my favorite dish, definition of a professional is someone who is responsible for achieving a result rather than performing a task. We're not day laborers, folks. You know, I, I don't hire a lawyer, accountant, doctor to mow my lawn and clean my gutters at, you know, 30 bucks an hour. I come to a professional to move me from where I am to where I would like to be or some type of desired state. Now, I'm not saying that you can guarantee an outcome. I understand lawyers can't guarantee they can win a lawsuit and accountants can't guarantee they can do, go through a no change IRS audit or an unqualified audit opinion. I understand you can't guarantee uh, an outcome, but the goal is to create an outcome and that's what professionals should be held accountable for. That's what separates being a professional from a service worker, an industrial worker, or a day laborer, right? But the billable hour and the timesheet, I believe, have atomized everything into a six-minute task. And, and when we focus on tasks, what do we lose sight of? We lose sight of the, the, the result that we're trying to create. So we also interviewed one of the authors of this book called The Experience Economy. His guy's name is Joseph Pine. The other author is James Gilmore. Highly recommend this book. Make sure you get the second edition. They've updated it. Joe Pine was a great guest, former IBM guy. Uh, data programmer, uh, pro, uh, computer programmer degree, I believe. But he wrote this book, and in this book, and it's, by the way, one of the reasons I got together with Dan Morris, because before the book came out, a Harvard Business Review article came out. And Dan came to one of my courses, and he walked up to me, and he, he handed me the article. He says, I'd like to teach this with you. And that's how Dan and I got together, and kind of the rest is history. But uh, they laid out a progression of economic value in this book, and they said, if you charge for stuff, you're in the commodity business. Like if you charge for wheat and you know things that you pull out of the ground, right? It's fungible stuff like oil. If you charge, so here's the heuristic that Joe Pine asked at every level. He said, how do you decommoditize a commodity? Okay, that's the question we're asking at every level. Make sense? How do you decommoditize a commodity? He said, well, if you charge for tangible things, you're in the good business. Take two commodities and put them together, wheat and flour, and make bread, right? You get a little bit more pricing power. Makes sense? Well, what happens when <laughs> your good becomes a commodity? How do you decommoditize a good? And he said, well, if you charge for the activities you execute, you're in the service business because now you're providing intangible. So maybe you wrap some services around your product, right? Like maybe Apple says, well, once you're done with your computer and trade it in, we'll recycle it for you, right? That would be an example of wrapping a service around a product. And there's tons of other examples in the book. But what happens when a service becomes a commodity? How do you decommoditize a service? Joe Pine said this, if you charge for the time customers spend with you, and we're not talking billable hours, we're talking about like getting into Disney World, <laughs> Right? You pay an admission and they let you use the park for the day or, or a series of days. You are in the experience business. So you take a service and you turn it into an experience and you, hopefully you make that experience memorable. And that's what Disney does, right? They make memories. They used to say happiness, now they kind of say we make memories. Um, and you're in the experience business. But what happens when an experience becomes a commodity? How do you decommoditize an experience? You know, as illustrated by the T-shirt, been there, done that, got the T-shirt, right? Not going to go to another Bruce Springsteen concert. I've already heard the guy, right? 
If you charge for the outcomes the customer achieves, then you are in the transformation business because that's an effectual outcome. You're actually transforming the customer. In other words, the customer's the product. You don't need to productize services. The customer's the product. And everybody in this room has the ability to transform a customer, whether you're a lawyer, an accountant, a consultant. Uh, uh, when, I, when I first read this, I couldn't believe it. I said, CPAs are already poised at the top of this curve. We help businesses grow. We help them become more profitable and more valuable. We help customers sell their businesses and enjoy their golden years, help them buy second homes, help them get their kids into college. We help them, and this applies more to attorneys, I believe, than accountants, but both do this type of work. We help them plan their legacy. How important is Warren Buffett and Bill Gates' legacy? You think, they, you think they have the cheapest estate attorneys? <laughs> you know, you think, you think they sit around on their jets and, and brag about, yeah, my, my lawyer, man, he's like 75 bucks an hour. It's great. No, their legacy is everything. And so when you do that, you're touching the customer's soul. I mean, I, I hate to get dramatic about it but, and poetic, but it's true. You're touching their soul. You're helping them leave their legacy. That, that's, that's magical. That's as far away from a commodity as you can get. And, and this is why we have a colleague in the North Island of New Zealand. His name is Peter Byers. When he practices a chartered accountant, he got close to $2 million in tips. I know because he used to, he used to fax me copies of the check before email uh, really hit the scene. And I, I asked him, and this is in my book, I said, how, how did you become such a savant at getting tips? Because he lives in a town with 6,000 people, two-thirds of which are farmers. And he said, I help people achieve their dreams. <laughs> That's a transformation. Everybody in this room should think of themselves as in the transformation business not selling a scope of work, not selling a series of tasks, not doing a series of deliverables. And if you price the transformation and then something comes up and you have to spend five more hours on this deposition or 10 more hours reconciling this bank, screw it. That's not what you're paid for. Focus on the outcome. Focus on the transformation that you're trying to accomplish. And if you price for that, the scope of work will take care of itself. It really will. D Dan is probably one of the worst project managers I know. And he doesn't do any cost accounting. However, he's great at the value conversation. He's a really good aggressive pricer. So he doesn't have to worry about that noise because he focuses on, like he told you in his talk this morning, about adding value, not even just between him and his customer, but in the outside world as well. So I think we're already here. Now I want to uh, play a video short. Tim Williams, I owe everything. Uh, for this video, Tim always finds the greatest videos. And I don't know where you got this, Tim, but when, when you showed this or you posted it somewhere, it, it blew my mind. I absolutely love this video. So I'll just play it and we'll talk about it. I operate very strongly with my instincts and I really either get, if I don't get it in the first crack, I get it in the second. And if I don't get it in the second, I almost never get it. Because, it, as I said, it's like a, it's very intuitive kind of process for me. I've never been a refiner. Um, I, my best work are kind of big, bold strokes that came very quickly. And it's problematic because my clients like, a lot of clients like to buy process and they think they're not getting their money's worth like I solved it too fast. I mean, Michael Beirut told me to shut up in an initial, initial meeting. I drew the Citibank logo, uh, you know, after we had the first meeting, I drew it on a napkin, walked out. You know, they had a, they had a merge Travelers and City and Travelers had an umbrella and, and Citibank is a word, you know, in the lowercase thing of a T is an umbrella, you stick an arc on the top and you got it. I mean, it didn't take, you know, it's like, it's a second, you know, it's all over the world. Like, how can it be that you talk to somebody and it's done in a second? But it is done in a second. It's done in a second in 34 years. You know, it's done in a second and every experience and every movie and every thing of my life that's in my head. Now, I think that's absolutely profound, the second plus 34 years. How long have you been working on your craft and investing in your intellectual capital your whole life. Um, 
I, I love that because that's a tangible example of an apocryphal story we used to tell about Picasso, uh, you know, sitting on a sidewalk cafe and a bold lady comes up to him, oh, would you, would you sketch me? And he pulls out the pad and he sketches her. She says, how much? He says, 5,000 francs. And she says, but it only took you a minute. He said, no, madame, it took me my whole life. Now, he priced in arrears, and that's the problem. But this is a real story. Now, uh, Tim, I don't know what they got for this logo. I don't... They did not go by the hour. This okay, good. You know, people talk about having a market price. And if you think about the Nike logo, you know, the swoosh, a lady named Kathy Davidson uh, did the Nike logo. For 35 bucks, they paid her. And Phil Knight didn't like it. He hated it, didn't want to use it. His team ended up talking him into it, but it took weeks. That's about $200 in today's dollars, $35 back in 1971. When Pepsi redid their logo, I think they paid Arnell a million. So I guess the market value for a logo is somewhere between $35 and a million. So folks, there is no market value. Markets don't buy things, people buy things. There's nobody here but us people. Procurement doesn't even buy things. Human procurement people buy things. IBM buys nothing. People in IBM buy things. And the other thing that she said in that video that I think is absolutely profound, she says people love to buy process. How can it possibly take a minute or whatever on that napkin? <clears throat> You're not selling process. You're selling transformations. And geez, if you can do it in a minute, it's double it, <laughs> triple it, right? I mean, that's phenomenal. So number six, from knowledge worker to relationship worker, I think we're kind of at a hinge point in history. You know, the people that lived through an era don't get to name it. So the, industri the term industrial revolution, I believe, wasn't e even coined until like 1930s, right? Even though the industrial revolution started 1800, 1850. I believe we're at another point. Knowledge worker came into the vocabulary in 1959, thanks to Peter Drucker and another economist. But we still haven't come to grips with it. But now I think if knowledge can be embedded in, in blockchains and smart contracts and IBM Watson, and make no mistake, it's not just information that's in these things, it's some knowledge. It's some knowledge. Then I think, like Stephen was saying, that we're, we're moving to the, the relationship worker. Now, I don't like that term either, uh, so I don't have a good term for this yet, but I believe, or maybe it's a transformation economy. By the way, when we had Joe Pine on the radio, we asked him, hey, Joe, what's beyond a transformation? He said, that, that's not decided here on Earth. That's for somewhere else, <laughs> right? Pearly Gates, whatever. Um, so I think we're moving to a relationship worker. And as we all know and have been talking about here all day, you know, we're a relationship business, and you don't build relationships staring at clocks. You spend a weekend helping a, a, a customer with a difficult problem with the sun like Paul did, and then you don't build them. Because if Paul would have, if Paul would have built that guy, yeah, he would have made some money. He might have even been able to get 40 grand from the guy. But he would have lost something in that relationship. Can you imagine going to your mother-in-law's house for a beautiful Thanksgiving dinner? You know, the trimmings, wonderful conversation, great food, great wine, great dessert. You have a lovely time. And at the end of the night, you say, gee, mom, that was great. And you hand her a check for a grand. You just cheapened the whole meal. And this is why we have to think about the relationship. And, you know, I've never heard anybody describe their marriage as efficient. You can't be efficient with people. We can be efficient with things. You can be, a, I want you to buy the best computers, technology, you know, like, like these guys over here have. But when it comes to human effectiveness, I can pick up the phone and call Robert and we can have a deep conversation about the show or any other thing that's troubling me or him. Uh, usually him giving me negative feedback about what I'm doing wrong, but, it, but it's a human connection. And that's what's valuable about these guys over here. Yeah, they've got all the tech stuff down, but that's a table stake. It's, I have a contact and I trust these guys. I trust them to, to amplify and make us sound good and you know all the other, all the rest of it. And it's not about efficiency. You can be efficient with things, but you have to be effective with people. 
And you know, he, uh, I, people think about Watson and all this technology. I'm, I'm, I'm loving it. I think this is the greatest thing in the world because it's going to take all the rote crap away from your, your, your tasks in your day. And it's going to allow you to move up the value curve. You know, Ed, who said the line that if, you, if your job has been replaced by a robot, your, your job probably sucked in the first place, <laughs> right? Uh, I, I, you know, I think there's something to that. Will we humans adapt? Absolutely. I, Rabbi Daniel Lappin is one of my mentors, even though I'm not Jewish. Um, he says, we humans will always find a way to serve God's children because work equals worship. The computer will come in. You sure, it's going to take away some tasks. It already has in accounting, bookkeeping. It's automated, you know, bank balancing and all sorts of great stuff. But what's it enabled the bookkeepers to do? To get closer to their customers and actually have a more in-depth relationship like we have with Robert. And that's, again, transformational. Number five, business models always change the pricing and what's measured. You know, we talk about business models. What is a business model? It's the way your firm creates value for customers and the way you capture it, right? So creating value and then capturing. Capturing is the pricing. But Andy Grove says disruptive threats come inherently not from new technology, but from new business models, right? And he knows a little something, being the former founder of Intel, about disruption, right? It's not so much the new technology, it's the new business model. Right now, technology can enable a business model. It can even accelerate it, like Uber, Airbnb. You know, uh, when Napster came out, it certainly disrupted the business model of the music industry. And then, of course, iTunes solved that whole legal morass. And but the point is, what I've learned about business models is, any time I study a business model throughout commercial history. I notice that anytime there's a new business model, there's a new pricing strategy. We go from buying a $20 CD to buying a buck a song, right? And an iPod or iPad or an iPhone, right? Um, but also something else changes. What you measure inside the company also changes. I can't find an exception to this rule. So we can sit around all day and talk about how important it is to change the business model, but we're gonna get what we measure, right? And if we have a new business model and we stick old measures on it, we're going to get old behaviors. This is why I'm so against implementing value pricing and keeping your timesheet. It doesn't work. <laughs> we know firms have tried it. It doesn't work. I see it over and over and over and over and over. It doesn't work. We've got to change what we measure. Now, we have alternative measurements that we believe actually add to your competitive advantage. Um, but let me just give you one example. If you've anybody seen this movie or read the book Moneyball by Brad, you know, by uh, Michael Lewis, and Ed, I could get Ed come up here and talk about this forever. But you know, this Never is the uh, yeah, I, <laughs> you wouldn't. Uh, the point is that this was a new way to to measure the effectiveness of a baseball team. It's called Sabermetrics. Ed's been a fan since like day one. Uh, who's the guy, Ed, Scott James, Bill James? Bill James. Bill James. Uh, he's an economist, Harvard-trained mathematician slash economist. He's the one that came up with Moneyball because it, it teams like the Oakland A's, who first use it and who the movie's about, I guess, in the book, they, they couldn't afford great players like the Yankees. So they had to measure different things. And they came up with better leading indicators. And then the Boston Red Sox picked up a sabermetric guru. And then that guy went to the Chicago Cubs. What's interesting about those two teams is they had curses on them, and they both won the World Series. The guy's name was Theo Epstein. Right? He's like 42 or something. Ed thinks he deserves the Baseball Hall of Fame. I think he's right. But the point is this was a business model change for these teams, and it changed what they measured. It changed what they measured. So number four, value pricing has major support and in investment. Again, I, I talked about this a little bit this morning, just talking about where, where we are in the professions with this. Companies like Sage, other, other uh, software publishers are investing major money into this. Uh, some uh, software vendors that do apps and other things plowing major investments and resources into education. Sage has been doing it for 10 years. They've been behind this message. Uh, they, they've supported us in our work. And now we're just seeing it spread more and more and more. It's really exciting. 
You couldn't have said that 15, 20 years ago, but you can say it today. Um, so we're, we're, I, I'm, I, I remain a paranoid optimist with respect to some of this stuff. I talked about the Black Swan program that Louis and I worked on when he was president of IPBC in Canada. This is a professional bookkeeping association. I told you one of the gals got a tattoo. This is it. Her name's Melissa. She was going to be here too, but she couldn't make it. Uh, but she actually tattooed our programs logo, basically, our, our, our mascot, if you will. Uh, not the Wiley Coyotes, Greg. Uh, I think they were the Pirates anyway, but, you know, that's, they should have been the Coyotes after they played last night. You know, I was, I was telling Paul, I said, you know, I, I'm looking at the band uh, making its way down the field last night, like it, three minutes into the first quarter. I thought there was a bomb threat or something that nobody told us. I said, but they're evacuating the stands. I mean, it took them, you know, two quarters to get down. And I just, I told Dad, I said, I'm so glad you left during the third quarter because if we got, we would have got behind the buses carrying that team, we, we would still be out there somewhere. <laughs> um, and Paul looks across at the other side, the home team, you see their band, he goes, <laughs> they call that a band? <laughs> uh, okay, number three, we need a top 25 law firm and accounting firm. A big four firm is really my target. I think we really need to land one of these firms. Tim's making progress on this and big firms in the, in the uh, advertising world. I think when you see a big four do it, then, then that competitive pressure kicks in. Well, if Price Waterhouse is smart enough to, you know, those idiots, we can do it too. Um, but it's, again, just like we talked about with the ulcer, it's going to take some time to convince the profession to move, but I think it's happening. So we already looked at that, so I won't discuss that. But I will ask you a question to ponder. Electricity was invented in the 1880s, right? Or I'm sorry, um, yeah, electricity was invented in the 1880s. Prior to that, Factories use steam power. So when was the first real factory that adopted electrical power? You would think, well, using electricity is a heck of a lot more effective and efficient, because we can be efficient with things. We're not anti-efficiency, just with people. So when did we see the first electrical factory? Well, it was actually the River Rouge factory of Henry Ford, about 1926. It took about, uh, by 1900, 20 some odd years after electricity was invented, less than 5% of factories were powered by electricity. It took nearly 50 years for factories to adopt electrical power. The question is why? Well, because when you adopted electrical power, it required different thinking. It required different architecture, production processes, workflow, and how the workers work, the entire system had to be changed. When they first installed electrical factories, they duplicated the op operations and the workflows of the steam engine factories. And it was a disaster, because this is new technology. And I think we're at the same point. With all this technology coming at us in the professions and these pricing model changes, we have to think different. Tim talks a lot about one of your biggest competitive advantages is in how you think differently than your competition. And that's enormous. And that's why we have to stay at the cutting edge of this stuff. Um, number two is Verisage. You know, I've talked about the Professional Pricing Society, and it dawned on me as I was thinking about coming here that I believe that we've become the Professional Pricing Society for professional firms. In other words, what I mean by that is the Professional Pricing Society has a certified professional pricer designation. And that, that slaps a, you know, a um, credential on a group of people and allows them to get hired by companies and it signals that they've been educated and they know something about economics and all these different di disciplines that we talk about with respect to pricing. I think we could start the same type of program for Verisage, so we're thinking about having some type of certified professional pricing designation that we would slap our imprimatur on, maybe in conjunction with the PPS, it, could happen that way, and I would love your feedback. So over tonight, as we go out and do things, and tomorrow, if you want to have a conversation, I would love to know what you think about having a professional pricing designation specifically for accounting firms, law firms, advertising agencies. I'd love to know what you think about that, because it's already happened in the corporate world, and now we would like to bring it to the professions, and we think we're the logical people to do it. Um, 
Again, Chris Elroy, Strickland, he said, the true measure of a leader is not just measured by the success of their organization, but by the measure of leaders they influence and develop to follow in their footsteps. When I look around at all these brilliant people, you know, guys like Mark Wickersham and all the fellows that are here and other people that are starting to do pricing, whether it's apps or consulting, and people say, gee, don't you get pissed off at all these people? They're just derivatives of your work, blah, blah, blah. Well, my work's derivative of a whole bunch of economists that I'm standing on the shoulders. No, I love these people because I want my ideas out there. That's why I started this organization. These people aren't a threat. They're carrying on our work. They're exactly what I wanted. And it's the highest point of leverage to have somebody like Mark who deals with you know, thousands of accounts or whatever it is, Mark. I don't know the number. You'll have to tell me. But I, th this excites me. That's, that's part of how we look at our success as an organization, the kind of impact. We, we believe at Verisage that we don't change one firm at a time. You change one mind at a time. It's one mind at a time. And then... The last thing, which was uh, number one also in Boston, I still have to say doing radio with Ed is still a blast. Uh, th this is just the, the greatest thing uh, I've ever done. I, I, I told you I'd tell you something about Robert Cellino. Ed and I did a webinar back uh, April of, what was it, Ed, 2014. It was on April Fool's, April 1st. I was in either Washington, D.C. I was, yeah, it was Washington, D.C. And Ed and I and Tom Hood, the uh, Association of uh, Maryland's CPA executive director, great guy, super innovative. We all did a program on why you need to adopt scientific management to run an accounting firm. So timesheets, efficiency, have stopwatches on people and all that. And it was a three. We didn't set up anything. We just dived into the material. We had everything. We had, for, Ed had all these formulas for efficiency of a CPA. People were asking questions. It was obviously an April Fool's joke, but nobody got it. <laughs> nobody got it. I tried to Google it and find it, and I, I can't find it, Ed. Maybe you, can, maybe you have a copy of it somewhere, but it was actually hysterical. But anyway, after I got off that uh, webinar, I got an email from Robert Cellino, and he says, you know, I found you through LinkedIn, whatever. He said, I'd really like to talk to you about doing a radio show, and I thought, Oh, geez, I've always wanted to be on radio. Um, this is really exciting. So I called him, and we talked, and we talked for a long time. And it dawned on me, I said, Robert, would it be okay? You know, what about having a co-host? Because I couldn't imagine stand, you know, sitting behind the microphone just you know, blabbing on like I have been here for an hour and a half. Uh, <laughs> and he said, I think that's a great idea. So I ran it by Ed, and the rest is history. But you know, this... These guys are dream makers. I mean, they, they, they have absolutely changed my life. I mean, it's because of them that we've got people like this to come on our show. And if you know any of these people, some of them are really big and don't do a lot of interviews, like uh, the second guy on the list never goes on anybody's show hardly ever. And he came on our show. It was only for 35 minutes, but we, at least we got him. So this has just been a great honor working with these guys. So folks, I know we want to get out of here. I'll just leave you with one thing, this Chinese proverb that I love. When the winds of change blow, some people build walls and others build windmills. Verisage is your windmill builder. So thank you very much, and let's have a great time at Topgolf.